so people on YouTube know that we're here. This is wonderful. Oh, yes. And we are officially live. Wait. Yeah. Yeah, we're officially live on YouTube. Hope everyone had a good evening or good day and is going to have a good evening. Oh. All right, I'm de de glassing. <laughs> Get to remember how to get that screen over there. Yeah, I think as soon as you're ready, David, we will get the ball rolling. There it is. Let's see. Wonderful. And thank you, everyone, for having already muted yourselves. That makes this easier. Oh, no. Okay. David, you good? Give me two seconds. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay, good enough. Sweet. Uh, we are going to ask everyone to do introductions in a minute. So if you could start poking around your screens and finding the unmute button, uh, that will help momentarily. Firstly, welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining. It's awesome to have you. And we can't wait to see you Saturday morning. Uh, this is going to be our classroom session. We'll talk about a bunch of stuff, including basic uh, protocol for how the event run, where to put your car, where to put yourself, where not to put yourself, and how to make sure that you're welcome back for the next event. And then we're going to talk about uh, my favorite part, which is the driving dynamics, how to drive your car quickly, how to drive it to its limits, and where to drive it. Uh, because just because you're at the limits all the time doesn't mean you're going as fast as you can. All right, I guess we'll do some intros. So um, myself, for those that haven't been to uh, an autocross yet, um, I've been doing this for quite a while. Um, I started uh, back in college uh, in the Midwest and um, have been autocrossing for somewhere around 21 years uh, so far. Um, I started locally, but um, soon uh, got the bug to start competing uh, at the national level uh, with the SCCA. So, um, so far I've been to about 15 national tours, which those are kind of our regional or divisional level events throughout the U.S. Um, and sometimes you got to travel for those. So it, it, it uh, is, is quite a bit of a, a change in competition. We'll get some of you there at some point. And then uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, going to the national championships uh, five times, a uh, little jaunt of kids in there. And um, uh, from that was able to get uh, three national trophies, um, all of which were in the... Um, the Civic that you see there, the type, the type R. Um, I also do other kinds of motorsports. So uh, through our local SCCA chapter, do um, our street survival teen driving program. I've done a number of uh, track instruction, things like that. And then also in that picture you see there, um, there's a group of us that do uh, endurance racing as well. So that's our little Ford Focus mellow yellow car that we do uh, endurance racing. So my particular experience, um, I've driven every platform, pretty much any type of car from um, complete stock Honda Civics, um, all the way up to, to supercars and hypercars. Um, currently mainly campaign, um, the Civic that you see, and then, uh, also recently started, uh, in an F mod, which is like, I don't know, an annoying go-kart, basically a louder and, and longer go-kart, um, that you may see at some of our events this year. So. I've been doing this almost as long as, uh, David Nolan has, I've been doing it for six years. <laughs> I did actually attend my first one uh, when I was 16 back in high school and just didn't get back to it for a long time. Uh, been loving it ever since. Basically uh, moved to St. Louis and started right away as soon as I moved and have not stopped. And then I moved to Atlanta just in November. 
I've been to three various national tours and only one visit to solo Nats so far, and that was last year. It's amazing. Uh, whether you stick around or not, you should come to solo Nats because it is one heck of a party. Uh, it is basically a car convention, and there's some autocrossing while we're there. Um, right now, I drive a BRZ in the Solo Spec Coupe class. Before that, I had a 2016, yeah, 2016 GTI. That was awesome fun, but uh, very happy to be in a rear-wheel drive car now. Cool. Want to do some folks' intros to see who we got? Yeah, I will go ahead and call people off so that we don't uh, get crazy with the order in here. And it's probably going to end up being in reverse order of how you joined. We have one call-in number, uh, 678. Uh, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, 678, Gail Brown. Uh, sure, you're not a call-in. Uh, but go ahead, since you've unmuted yourself. Oh. Uh, I'm Gail Brown. And uh, I've been doing track nights for about six years. And so the car's been all set up for running on road courses. And uh, I'm, I'm getting old and uh, the high speed is <laughs> starting to bother me. So I'm guessing you um, won't be the oldest person there, just to give you a heads up. We've got uh, uh, some folks in their 90s that uh, run with us as well. So, well, really? Well, I'm only 78, so I feel better. <laughs> You got some competition. Then. <laughs> what, uh, what car do you drive there, Gail? Uh, RX-8 Mazda. RX-8. Awesome. I got one that's got the rotary in it, and I built another one foolishly with the LFX drivetrain. So, but I'm awesome. bringing the, I'm bringing the rotary one. <laughs> Very cool. I have not had the privilege of driving an RX-8, but always been one of my favorite cars. They're not quite as annoying as an F mod. <laughs> not even close. Thanks, thanks for joining us, Gail. Sure. Chris Beckworth. Hey, yeah, Chris Beckworth. Um, zero experience in this, so it's all new to me. Um, I'll be driving a heavy four door E63. <laughs> so um, I don't have a two door yet. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. You know, I'm just going to learn and take it from there. You're so going to have a blast. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Yeah, that's, that's why I hear and, and see. So, Awesome. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, Chris Youngblood. Yeah. Also, first time doing any sort of auto event. Um, I'm coming out with a 2017 Jetta. So, you know, I'm interested to see how that plays out in autocross. But uh, I thought it seemed like a, a, a more reasonable entry to taking out a car like mine and trying to see what it can do without necessarily trying to push high RPMs or high miles per hour. So no, it seems, seems like it's going to be a really good experience. We should uh, warn you, Chris, it's a gateway autosport. So I've know. already <laughs> been gatewaying, just preparing for this. Admittedly leading to this, I was already gatewaying through all the sim stuff that exists. And I, you know, it shows, it shows you all the things that can be, but fake. So yeah, here we are. I am a firm believer that uh, sim racing on even something cheap like a Logitech G29 or G27 is legitimate practice for real life driving. No, it doesn't. You know, it's not fair, but just the, the, the versatility it offers is just very addicting. And the notion of being able to do the real cars is obviously exciting as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Glad to have you as well. Uh, Dustin Treadwell. Hi, so this will also be my first time. Um, been trying to get into it for a while. Just moved back into Georgia from Colorado. Uh, did one ice race while out there. Was not successful. Um, and I'll be driving a Focus ST. Focuses aren't bad cars, I'll tell you that. Yeah, you'll be in good company. There's a lot of Focus STs, Civics, GTIs. They're popular class. Hume Lee, but sorry if I mispronounced that. Hume 
Kuhn Lee, do you, uh, can you find your unmute button and introduce yourself? Typical work. <laughs> and I've got something blocking my screen. Anyway, um, yeah, I did an auto cross in college years ago. Um, and so this will be the first time I go to one that's more um, organized, to say. I've uh, been doing a lot of sim racing because it's cheap. I'm looking to earn some cash doing some real life racing. Um, I've got an 8th gen Civic Si. Um, looking forward to uh, having some fun this Saturday. Awesome. Looking forward to meeting you. Yeah. Uh, oh, did I pronounce your name right at all? It was close. It's Hyun, but Hyun, okay. pretty darn close. Eighty percent there. So, okay. <laughs> cool. Thank you, uh, Joe Radzinka. Radzinska. Smith. It's pronounced Smith. Smith. Oh, <laughs> it's it's Um Joe Radzinskis. I uh, am new to autocross. Uh, any type of racing. Uh, bought a two thousand seven. Uh, Mustang Roush 427R, and uh, it's a lot of fun in my brain and in all my video game adventures racing. I feel like I'd be a good, I think I'd be good at this, but I want to find out for myself if that's actually true or not. Um, and I'm a little, the car's so powerful, I'd, I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to take it, have it somewhere where it's safe. And if something does slide out or anything happens, I'm not going to hurt nobody or in nobody's property or anything. So I've had the car for a long time. I actually joined the SCCA in, in South Florida um, back right before COVID hit. And COVID hit and we there were no races. You couldn't go do anything. And all I was doing was paying membership for a magazine every month. Um, so I stopped it and then ended up moving here, uh, working for Aaron's. That's how I met David. Uh, he got me a uh, 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 got the bug back in me again. And I understand, I even said to him yesterday, you're going to get me hooked. Something I, 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 I really enjoy driving, uh, at, uh, and I, I enjoy intense driving, I guess, if that's a good way to put it. And it feels like, um, racing is kind of a, a, a cool, a cool event. So I'd like to see if it's something that I'd be good at or, or, uh, if I just wasted a couple hundred bucks on a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> Love it that you already bought your helmet. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. awesome attitude to have. Love, yeah, love autocross that. is a, a great way to to start it in a lower risk environment. Obviously, all motorsports is not completely without risk. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to wear a helmet. But um, it's or it's sign the waiver or sign a waiver. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's a it's a great way to start, though. Um, you know, we say it's parking lot speeds or or on road speeds. Um, and it's a, it's a great opportunity, especially I, I give kudos to everybody for being part of this because a lot of people just go right into it. And, um, this is a good opportunity to unlearn bad habits very quickly and it will get you on the right track right off the bat. Uh, Keith Davis, I know you're not a novice, but, uh, you're next on my list. Go for it. Well, I'm on the list. Awesome. Uh, name's Keith Davis. <clears throat> I drive a 22 Hyundai Kona N. Uh, last year was my first year doing this. I was in the rookie class last year driving in a, a D Sport with, a, with my Kona being pretty much stock. Uh, I'll also be one of the instructors come Saturday. Kyle. You're, I see you're unmuted, but we don't hear you. Kyle, while you work out audio issues, I'm going to move on and we'll come back to you. Uh, Mark Nakin. Hey, guys. Mark Nakin. Um, I, uh, Experience-wise, I did one day of the two-day run fellows C8 Corvette class before I got COVID. I had a drop out of the second day. Um, but I'm bring, bringing my um, uh, ND2 Miata for the autocross want to start there uh and yeah i already went and bought my helmet i always wanted to do this but my job has just been too all-consuming to really get involved at all but i'm retiring at the end of this month so i figured i'd get started nice congrats raven raboon I 
I see you're also unmuted, but we don't hear you. We'll come back to you too. Uh, Robert Santiago. Hey, my name is Robert Santiago. Uh, I got a 22 Elantra N. Uh, Keith been posting about it and stuff, so I want to come out and try it. It's new to me, so see what I could learn from y'all. I got destroyed by an Elantra N at Nationals, so uh, <laughs> yeah, the car is plenty good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, good. I'm out to learn, so. Yeah, that's another wonderful car to be learning in. Uh, Tech Titans. Hey, there's actually three of us here. So I'm Joe uh, Gerhard Stein. Um, I have a Series 1 RX-8. Um, just have done a couple track days, one or two autocrosses, but it's probably been about 15 years. Kids kind of got in the way, and we're trying to get back into it now. <laughs> sure, yeah. blame them. So I have a 1992 Miata. I started doing track days with her in 1994. Did that again for a number of years, and then we had kids. And now we're pulling them into it with us. Introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Monica. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah, you don't have our names Smith. up there. Smith. <laughs> Here yes. All right, I'm Andy. I drive an R55 Mini Cooper that has just had a transmission replaced. So I shouldn't have any problems with slipping gears like I've had the past like three years. I've done some of these courses before, but it's been a while since I've done it. We'll see where it goes from there. <laughs> Awesome. Glad to have all of you here. And the dog, but he, he loves riding in the Miata, but he doesn't autocross. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We uh, haven't updated our rules to allow dog passengers. We, we couldn't find a helmet to fit him, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, I believe there were some late joins that uh, have not introduced themselves yet, so I don't have you guys in order. So. Austin, Aaron, maybe. Very good. Yeah, someone who hasn't, go for it. Aaron, yeah. Oh, we can't hear you. Let me try. Uh, yeah. Anyone else want to introduce yourselves? Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, uh, I'm Austin. I have a 2013 Hyundai Veloster Turbo. Um, as far as autocross experience, I haven't actually had any experience there. Uh, have a good amount of time built up on sim racing, a little bit of card experience too. Uh, as far as track, the only experience I have is just running on a land motor speedway, but uh, autocross is something that's new to me. Excellent. Well, we're outside the speedway for this event, just to, just to remind everybody. <laughs> Understood. Um, it, we do have the chat feature on here for those that are having audio trouble. Um, if you did want to ask questions, we don't have to introduce ourselves. Um, David and I just wanted to do it. Um, that way we can understand, um, who we've got, what the experience is, and we can kind of tailor it a little bit more directly. So David, you want to get us started? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kyle, for the intro of, uh, six years autocross in a 94 Del Sol. That's gotta be good fun. And, uh, glad to have you back out. Okay, let me get the presentation going again. Okay. So let's talk about just some uh, event basics. We'll get to this as quick as we can and start talking about the more fun stuff, uh, driving dynamics after this. All right, so um, I'll cover our, uh, our tech slide here. So um, this is kind of a big thing. Uh, a lot of people, uh, don't think about it ahead of time. Uh, but the the big thing is like, I always get asked, what do I got to do to make sure my car is good for that day? Um, a lot of basics, right? Make sure your fluids are, are topped up. Um, the biggest thing is take everything out of the car. Um, not Maybe not literally everything, but uh, anything loose. Um, it's either going to fly around and be annoying um, or it's just adding weight and you don't really necessarily need that. So, um, if you're one of those cars from back in the day with a giant sub, that's not tied down, take that out. Um, and, um, I always advise cause you're taking stuff out. If it looks like there may be rain, which we still run in the rain, bring a Rubbermaid or something or a tarp to, to cover your stuff, uh, up, uh, as well. Um, we want to make sure you're not leaking. If you got an older car, uh, or a BMW, 
Um, we want to make sure you have your battery tied down. This is one thing that actually um, I've seen more of than not on older cars. Um, as long as it's not moving, I don't care if it's zip tied or um, it has some creative uh, metal strap that you created. Ideally, we want that uh, positive battery terminal covered too, but most cards already have a, a plastic cover for that. Um, we check your brakes. We check to make sure like um, your um, bearings and, and tie rods and stuff um, aren't, aren't loose. Uh, we just want to make sure everything's broken. If you did buy your own helmet, hopefully you bought the right one. Uh, <laughs> every software we get somebody, it's not. The biggest thing is uh, no DOT ranking. So that's like a standard DOT motorcycle helmet. Um, easiest way to tell it is um, you can open up the, the lining and there should be a reflective decal in there that will say uh, Snell and it either has an SA or, a, or an M um, and it's got to be within the last 15 years. So that is um, essentially is what's that 2005 currently it's going to be 2010 here uh in another year uh or newer um and that's um mainly because of the ratings and things like that we do accept some eu designations and and fia and things like that but snell is the most popular and lastly numbers uh especially if you're going to come out to a lot of events it's one of the things helmet tire gauge and numbers uh or numbers and letters are going to be the things you're going to want to invest in first um, we've got some fun examples here, but the biggest faux pas is making them super teeny and hard to read um, or making them um, really hard to read. So blue car, blue tape, white white car, white tape, or on a window that, um, you know, you can't really, really see. Um, we we want to make sure um, that uh, that those are safe. Um, you can do tape while um, you're early. Uh, and Saturday, it's a little less important, but if you come out with a Sunday, uh, and we encourage you to stay for Sunday to actually race against everybody, um, then tape's fine. Uh, but if you're going to do it for a while, get it, get it magnets are going to be tall enough. Um, there is eight inch tall is the official SECA and four inch for the, uh, the class. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, we did see a question here. Um, so there is tons of tech rules outside of these normal ones. The question is really specific to harnesses. Um, so, um, I, I, me or Deech, I don't think Deech is going to be there. So I usually end up tagging the harnesses just cause I run a lot of race cars with them. Um, biggest thing with the harnesses is that they're, they're properly bolted in. Um, so they're not just cheap eye bolts. Um, and they're actually have backing on them. The one thing that I usually see that people don't do with a, with a harness, which we can fix on site is how you loop them and double back the, the straps through the D rings. Um, so all that, uh, if you followed, um, the install, requirements um not say belt uh, say belt has an install but uh scroth if you look for their install um uh tutorial they've got a few pages on there and the right way of doing it so other stuff will advise you that maybe you could be a little safer with the harnesses but ultimately we'll we'll let you run all right and if you uh want to make fun of me or you want to learn more um there's a youtube video uh in this video that or uh, in this powerpoint that uh, David will send out um, of me kind of going through all that. I'll, I'll post it in chat for everyone real quick. Can, you can all save that for later. Um, <laughs> I'll just mention since we uh, talked real quick about harnesses, if anyone gets into this and they're like, wow, this is really cool and you want to spend a little bit of extra money, it's legal in all classes, you can look up the uh, quick fit, which is super cool. I have one in my car. You can come see it. There's presumably a bunch of them at an autocross event. You can see how they fit in various cars. But the idea is you can put a harness in a street car and not have it be in the way when you're just going to work. So grid, uh, grid is where you're gonna park when you are ready to start driving. Uh, we typically do these in at least two heats. We'll break everyone in half uh, for this Nava school. And for a typical event, we always hope that we have enough people to break you in three heats. That ends up being the best uh, experience generally. And grid is where you're going to be when your heat is driving or when your heat is about to be driving, you can move your car into the second grid. We'll have two grid spaces, one for each heat. Uh, it's going to be your staging area before you actually head out to the start line. So you're going to start when you arrive to the lot, you're going to start in the paddock. That's where the trailers will be. That's where everyone unpacks their stuff out of their car. And then as it get, comes time for you to start driving, you're going to move your car into a grid spot. 
We don't have designated grid spots. We do have some reserved areas for two driver cars, but you're not going to get a parking spot number. You're just going to go find a spot. And, and you'll, right. you'll come back to that same spot each time though, throughout the yes. day. Yes. It just won't be the same spot every single event. I don't think we have any two drivers in this group, right? It's all one car, one driver. If you, I don't if remember you, anyone registering as a two driver. If you, Sorry, if you are a two driver, we will split you into different heats. So okay. we won't, yeah. And, and that does happen in regular events. So we had the the family of three folks on here. A lot of times they share a car. Um, just just find the grid workers and say, hey, I've got two people, one car, and we'll we'll get you in the right spot. And if you are a two driver for this novice event specifically, please come find me on Saturday and let me know. Uh, if you're more, if you've got three people in one car, especially, please come let me know. Uh, we'll get you sorted out. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Generally, just don't be the first one into grid. Let someone who's been around for a while be the first one into grid. That'll help you figure out where to park, what direction to point your car, what side of the cones to park on. We could get into all this and teach you how to figure it out, but just don't be the first one. Follow the leader. And don't be the last one, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all, all of this with a novice, try to get there early. I know it's an early day, but you're going to be racing and having fun, so it's worth it. Um, the biggest mistake I see of novices showing up is they show up late and they're rushed. They can't get a full course walk in. They arrive to grid late and things like that. So just get here early and get, get to all the um, places early. We love to help, so no dumb questions. Yeah. Uh, since we're talking about getting there early on the registration page for this, we mentioned uh, driver's meeting is going to be 830. We are going to try and stick to that. So try to be there no later than eight. That way you have time to get your car unpacked uh, and be ready for the driver's meeting at 830, where we will talk through the day's agenda and we will pair you with your instructor if you are signed up for the novice school registration. And we're at Atlanta Motor Speedway, not Atlanta Motorsports Park. We had somebody go that way. It is completely on the other side of town and like three hours away. So AMS, it's south of town. Um, Joe, you can get there at 5 a.m. if you want, but the gates will be closed. Uh, I, I'm joking. Usually we open the gates around 7, but um, once you start doing this more often, we love help. So, um, But we'll probably still be setting up at that point. But again, getting stuff out of your car and all that is is a great thing to start on. I would say if you like to be early, 7.30 is probably great. That'll, uh, you will not feel rushed if you arrive at 7.30. And yes, Joe, bring your mommy, bring your daddy, bring your children. So long as they're over, I think it's 12 or 12. 13, they can ride along. Yeah, a lot of people ask that. So you can bring kids under 12. Um, they can't ride. And there is a um, parent waiver. Uh, actually, both parents or both guardians have to excuse me, have to sign. So um, all my kids are under 12, but um, if they want to ride along between 12 and 18, they have to have that waiver uh, and they have to at least be 12 uh, to ride along. And you can bring your mommy. Okay. Uh, there are typically two grid workers, uh, two special workers assigned to each heat that are working grid. And they are going to be walking up and down the line of cars and they're going to be directing traffic. The first one that you see is going to hold up their hand and say, you've got five cars ahead of you. That is your warning. If you are not already in your car with your helmet on at that point, it is time to get in your car and put your helmet on, get that seat ready, get going. Cause you've got five times 20 seconds is minute and a half. If all is going well, you've got a minute and a half before uh, it's time to go. Ideally, you're going to keep your eyes uh, looking whichever direction down grid you need to be looking to know where that five car person is. I'm generally looking to see, hey, there's three, four, five people in front of me all with their helmets on. It's probably time for me to get my helmet on too. I'm a little bit slow to get my car and get ready, so maybe you can go faster than that. But first person is going to come by and give you the five car warning. Next person that you see is going to send you. That's the only warnings you're getting. So you need to be aware of what's going on around you. If you're a novice school registrant for this first event, you're going to have an instructor that's going to help you with that. Uh, uh, when you do come into grid, do please park on a diagonal, as you can see in this photo here. The idea is that there's not a whole lot of space between the grid lanes, and some of those big fat Mustangs can't uh, turn very sharp and they need to be at a diagonal to get through to the start line. So we need to make sure everyone has enough space to get through. 
So a question, David. Um, so we get there, when we get there, we, we pull into the, it looks like the space behind that, the grid right there. You take your stuff out of your car, cover with a tarp in case it rains. When when is the instructor piece? Is that instructor riding with us the whole time? Like how does what does that relationship look like? How does that how does that get engaged? Who do we know? When sure. do we know who our instructor is going to be? David Nolan, <clears throat> and how do we uh, like how does that how does that how do we engage all that? On yeah. Saturday? So for those of you who signed up as a Nava School student uh, during the drivers meeting, or I suppose it's probably going to be at the end of the drivers meeting, we're going to announce the student instructor pairings. And then they will walk back to you with your car and do your tech, walk you through what, um, you know, get, get to know you a bit, and uh, they'll walk you through the rest of that. Okay, excellent. And we'll we'll take your car and stuff like that, if I remember right. So um, normally the way it'll work at a, a bigger event is after driver's meeting, we'll start yelling at you to go get your car and put them in grid. Or if you're assigned to work on course, we'll yell at you to go do work on course, which we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah, that's a good plan. We're going to do things in a little bit reverse order because we want to get those instructor pairings done early in the morning. Normally, the driver's meeting would be like the last thing that happens before we start sending cars, but we'll do it a little different order uh, on Saturday. Oh, uh, space is tight, uh, as mentioned there on the slide. Try to leave any extra things that you have over in paddock. Uh, I bring a bin with my stuff, my uh, tire pressure gauge, my you know coat, extra shoes, whatever. A bin, my water sprayer, and that's about it. Uh, if you're bringing a tent or a sleeping bag or whatever, leave that stuff over in paddock. Okay, so once that person has come by and said, it is your turn to go, what do you do? You follow the leader because the person to your left or right will have just left and you can just follow them. Uh, in general, that means you're gonna pull up, you're probably gonna have one or two, maybe three cars in front of you before you get to the start line. You'll pull up for, uh, in front of them. When it's one car in front of you, uh, they're pulled up to the start line and you're right behind them. You might give them one car length of space or so. This Corvette might be spitting a bunch of rocks out the back and you probably don't want your front bumper getting pepper sprayed. Uh, if you're sitting behind me and my white BRZ, you are definitely going to get pepper sprayed because I have to launch that thing at five grand. Uh, yeah, the, the other thing is they'll do uh, some form of a motion, right? To help yeah. show you you're getting closer. Um, so pay attention to that person standing by the double cones. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll do a sign like this to say how far you are and they'll start bringing their hands together uh, and then they'll go like this or they'll go like this. Uh, it's very common for a novice to blow past where your starting spot is and then have to back up. So as you get close, just kind of come to a crawling and slowly move up and we'll tell you to stop. For the school, it's not as big of a deal. It's more of practice just kind of getting into it. But for um, the actual race, the farther forward you are, the more space you're losing before you can uh, accelerate uh, for the start. So you're actually going slower as a result of that. It's the one area as well that you can angle yourself however you want. So you want to point yourself towards where you want to go, even if that's the line is this way and you got to point yourself across that line at a weird angle. That's OK. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh the starter's going to hold you for 20 seconds. We try to space cars out on course 20 seconds apart. Uh, that'll come in later, but that's important to know. When the starter does release you, please leave the starting line. Don't say, oh, okay, time to turn my traction control off, time to tighten my seat. No, no. When the starter sends you, please go. As you can see by the basic math there, if everyone just sits around for five seconds, as short as that is, that's a 25-minute longer heat because people aren't going when we tell them to go. It doesn't mean you need to do a massive burnout every time. It doesn't mean you need to let, you know, we're, we're not timing how quick you can go, but don't linger. As you're sitting at the starting line, before you even get to the starting line, actually, uh, you need to know where that first element is. As Nolan pointed out, you kind of want to get your car pointing in the right direction. Okay, so as you're pulling up to that starting line, you should already be eyeing the first element to drive through so you know what direction to point your car, and so you have already started planning out the course that you're gonna be driving. Uh, I think, oh, uh, I'll just point out there, 
you can't see it in this photo that I included, but there's basically going to be two sets of um, gates, two sets of double cones. The first set is where the starter is going to hold you. And then the second set generally was it, David, probably about 10 feet forward. That's where the starting lights will be, a uh, laser beam that uh, you're going to break, and that's going to start your clock. And we may uh, make you turn before the lights. Either way, you have an acceleration zone before the lights start. It gives you a chance to really get the car moving, and it tries to balance high horsepower cars to Yadis. Yeah. Sorry, Miras. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think this is me. So red flags, uh, this is more for your safety, right? Um, if you're ever the corner worker in the future um, or if you're just driving, um, it's it's one of those things I always say, like on course, you're not looking at the corner stations. You're, you're fixating on where you're going. If you see a ra red flag waving in the corner of your eye, if you see someone trying to get out in front of you, that means come to a controlled stop. Uh, wait for instructions. The reason the red flag's going is something dangerous is happening on course. Typically what that is, is a car's broke or, or someone got lost on course and we're trying to slow you down so you, got, you don't come in any way near another car. Our goal is safety with all these. We want everybody to come back and not have any sort of accidental uh, type of type of incursion and stuff. So um, don't worry. If it's not your fault, you're going to get a rerun. I mean, for these novice events, you're going to get tons of runs anyhow. But um, it could be something as simple as like, We've had uh, a random RC car come out that someone was playing with on another parking lot or, you know, maybe a piece of trash or an animal or something like that has run out. Could be anything, but come to a stop uh, and and then proceed. Um, when you're working a corner, we're going to have you work corners um, during this event uh, because uh, it's important. Right, David? I think I said that right. Um, the reason we're doing that is not to turn you into slave labor. It's really to give you the experience of seeing cars racing from outside as well as getting you used to um, working. Big things are don't be sitting, don't be playing on your phone. Eyes up, there is cars going fast around you and we need you alert uh, in case one of them uh, were to lose were to lose control. Um, we want you to go in out there fast. The biggest thing with corner workers um, where it gets frustrating and again, where the event gets longer is after you've run or if you're, if you're working first, getting out there in a timely fashion um, we usually try to get you on an ATV and get you out there quickly, but if you just lollygag and, and you're the last one out there, everybody's going to be frustrated at you because it's, it goes, uh, a lot longer. Um, most of the time, if you're not doing a uh, corner captain, you're basically going to be running after cones. So, uh, the key point I always heard is don't watch the front of the car, which is kind of the habit when we're humans watching people move around, watch the back of the car. Cause what you're looking for is, is a cone to be disturbed in some way, either knocked over or wiggled. And your job as a corner worker is to run out there and check it, either set it back up in a box, which we'll have a slide on, um, or or check it and kind of put it back up. Um, I always uh, encourage you to have hand signals back to your corner captain who will have a radio uh, typically and will radio in the penalty. Um, simple hand signals are holding the cone up in the air if it's a penalty and then putting it back down or putting a big X over your head if the car um, went off course, which again, we'll talk about later. Um, the, the other thing we do provide water for you, but, um, bring water if you need it. Um, and don't turn your back on a car. It's, it's really easy. You know, I'm hyperactive. I love talking to people. It's really easy to get talking to folks, but you've got cars driving around out there. So never turn your back on a car. Even if you're running after a cone, a lot of times I'll run backwards. If I know a car is coming, um, and you know, keep, keep an eye out for cars, uh, for the other people you're working with as well. Kind of a brother's keeper type concept. Yeah, uh, never turning back on a car is, is so important. It doesn't happen often, uh, but people do get hurt at an autocross, and it's usually because they weren't paying attention or because something crazy went happened with a car, it's way off course, something like that. I don't know if you're aware, we're going to have some new people uh, at the event on Saturday, and they might not be where you expect them to be. So make sure you're looking out for those cars. With that said, most, of, most injuries are uh, people getting hurt in the uh, parking area like yeah. running into a trailer or stubbing <laughs> their toe or something like that so yeah. all right okay uh how do we make sure that you're all welcome back at the next event um this is not in any particular order uh but one good one to keep in mind is though we do love it when you come up and ask us questions i would love to help you out with anything you've got questions about i would appreciate if you read body language, whether it's my body language or someone else's. If I'm in my car, helmet on, eyes closed, and you know, kind of making weird 
you know, body language, it's probably because I'm running the course in my head and now's not a good time to talk to me. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, when, as, oh, go ahead. And generally we don't mind, uh, especially as experienced folks giving ride-alongs, um, okay. but no, in a normal event, not the novice event, we'll ride along all day long with you in that. Our third run is usually the for the the pros at least is the one we're most focused on we don't just generally take passengers everything after the third run we generally take all the passengers we want because it's there to show people and have fun it, for us in the pro classes uh is not a an actual competition run um i always say ask there are some people that don't like giving ride-alongs um and, and worst they can say is no but what i found is when i bring people along you will generally ride along in every car you want to um, there'll be a, be a handful. Um, don't ask to drive someone's car though. That's, uh, <laughs> that's more for the experienced drivers. Uh, and it's kind of up to the, the owner as well, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how many cars you can ride along. In. It doesn't matter generally if it's a Jaguar BMW or a beat to crap Honda Civic. Everyone loves it when you uh, ask for ride alongs. So be ready for a no, but a lot of times, most of the time it'll be a yes. Uh, as Nolan just mentioned, when you are out there working course, do please run for the cones as soon as it's safe. Uh, that is another good manner thing because as we mentioned during the grid, you're going to have another car coming right behind that one 20 seconds later. You've got 10, eh, probably what, seven or eight seconds to get there, get the cone back up, another seven or eight seconds to get back safely out of the way again. If you can't get the cone up again, um, in that time frame, run to a point that is closer to the cone, wait for the next car to drive by, they'll get a rerun, assuming they stop and point at it. You don't have to worry too much about that. And then run the rest of the way to the cone in the next 20 second window, put it back up and get out of the way again. Your safety is always more important than getting a cone set up. Like um, everybody's days, including yours, will be ruined if there's a if there's an accident. Uh, so if, if you don't think you have time or you look and you can't find the box and you see a car coming, just get out of the way. It's not a big deal. Yep, absolutely. Okay, uh, we'll mention it again because it's really important. Don't be late to your work assignment. It's really annoying when we have to hold up an event because we don't have enough corner workers on course to uh, get the heat rolling. Shenanigans in paddock, it's a big no-no. We're here to drive fast and have fun in a safe and controlled manner. If you want to uh, do shenanigans, then do that somewhere else without your SCCA stickers, numbers, et cetera, on the car. We don't want to be associated with it. Same for drifting, donuts, burnouts, whatever. We're here to autocross in a safe and controlled manner. Uh, and then just be a generally good human being. We don't want to hear demeaning or rude language don't talk about how crappy this person is because they didn't drive well or because they designed a crappy course or whatever. Be good to people. We're all friendly. All right, let's do the fun part. That is an actual autocross car. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, the, the previous one. I mean, this one too, maybe. Yeah, yeah. You Probably. should you should dress your F-Mod car up like that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so driving the course, we're going to go through a lot of the the science behind it and to learn what your car is doing. The the biggest thing to know um, when a novice, you as a driver are the biggest thing that can be improved. So yes, there's probably things you're going to be like, oh man, my car handles blah or bad or it's slow or it's this. Just you focusing on your driving, you improving on these things we're going to talk about is going to gain you so much more time than that mod or spending, you know, a thousand dollars on a on a cat pack exhaust. That money spent into driving events and taking classes and things like that, like you're doing, is going to make you so much faster than any modification will. So pay attention to this stuff. The big thing, like we talked about, is starting slowly to build uh, good habits early. A lot of your habits you're going to find, and some of them we're going to talk about, are going to be counter to what you're supposed to do. It's just human nature. It's because you haven't been in these, you maybe don't understand the dynamics of why the car is doing what it what it's doing. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna talk you through the, a lot of that. The the quickest things um, to make you fast are counter to what you think. It has nothing to do with the throttle and the brake. It has everything to do with looking up. Um, autocross. Uh, when people quit and say I'm done with this uh, after the first event, it's often because they get lost. And our goal 
is to not for you to be fast your first run. It's to find the course. It's to get comfortable with it. The biggest way you're going to do that is by looking up um, or eyes up, looking far ahead. Um, if you're looking at the element you're driving through as you go through it, you're going to suddenly look for another element and you're going fast enough. It's going to be on you before you're ready for it. And then you're going to get overwhelmed and you're going to get behind. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about the racing line and what it is to apex and and drive through the the corner as fast as possible. And the other thing um, is the concept of backsiding a cone or or thinking, okay, every every major apex cone or every major cone I'm going to come around, I want to come and point my car as much on the back as possible. The reason we tell you to do that is it's the safest way, and generally it's the it's going to be the way that you make the least mistakes to start out. It's not always the fastest as you get faster, but it's a good start. Uh, the other thing we talked about arriving early, um, you want to walk the course a lot, like a ton. And, um, you know, if you've got a, a medical condition, you can't walk, we can talk about that. There's some exemptions we could do and stuff uh, for, for some uh, moving devices. Generally, you're not allowed to use things like scooters and bikes. Um, but walking the course is important. I recommend at least two to three walks for a novice, uh, if not more. Find an experienced person you can walk with. If you have a co-driver or somebody else, walk with them. Uh, on Saturday, we're going to be doing guided walks. So your uh, instructor will walk with you and talk through the elements, talk how to drive them, talk about your car, talk about dynamics, all that. Uh, but in a normal event, you want to walk it a ton because you don't get to practice like you do on the track. You can't come to an HPDE or a track night, drive the course 100 times, and then slowly, incrementally work your way uh, a tenth of a second off every time that you come there. Autocross, one of the biggest fun parts and the biggest challenges is you show up and you've never seen that course. And the only time you get to drive it is your first run uh, and then on. So that's a challenge and walking is your, your uh, only opportunity to do it. And then vehicle dynamics. And that's really all the different fun stuff we're going to talk about of what your car is doing and, and physics and stuff, understeer, oversteer, how to react to what your car is doing and how to know that you made a mistake and your car telling you made a mistake and how to fix it for the next time. These are what we're going to talk about, and uh, hopefully the, the stuff, if you can't tell, I get most excited about. I'll just toss in one quick thing. So Nolan mentioned how the, the biggest thing you can work on is yourself. It includes the balance that we're going to talk about, how, you know, changing tire pressures or roll bar or spring or shock settings, all of this tuning you can do on a car to make you to make it faster. We're talking tenths, maybe half a second for a big change to the tuning of a car. Whereas, uh, you know, fixing the nut behind the wheel, that could shave a second. Easy. No problem. Shave a second off a, a run. Commonly two, three, four, five seconds. So really, when we say it's probably the driver, it's probably the nut behind the wheel, we mean it. Tuning the car isn't going to be, isn't going to fix that. Okay, so let's talk about the just the basics of how to navigate through an autocross course. There's really only two core concepts on an autocross course. There's a gate, that means two cones and you have to drive through them. And there's a slalom. A slalom is defined as any set of three cones in a straight line. Three or more, sorry. I mean, three or more cones in a straight line implies that you need to weave through the cones that are in a straight line. That's it. Everything else is a combination of gates and slaloms. Uh, this second photo that we see here, this is a gate followed by another gate sharing one of those cones, followed by another gate sharing one of those cones and another gate. They're all just gates. Again, with this third photo, this is a lot of gates all sharing this one center left cone. And then the next one, we have another gate here sharing these two cones. That's it. They're just gates, drive through the cones. This is a slalom. Uh, might be a little bit of an optical illusion here with this wiggly arrow. That will be your pointer, by the way, David. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. So with a slalom, you need to drive on either side of the cones. In this specific picture, we have a pointer cone that is telling you it is non-optional. You must drive to the right of this cone. That therefore dictates, because it's a slalom, what direction you need to drive on each side of the remaining cones. So for this one, you must drive on the right-hand side of the cone. That implies that you must drive on the left side of the next one and bouncing back and forth all the way to the end of it, however many there are. Same thing over here. Um, this pointer cone is 
just a visual aid. Uh, this is clearly a gate. You must drive through this gate. Uh, but the pointer cone is often on gates just for visual aids to make sure uh, you kind of know where you're going. Okay, so even though it might be as simple as just gates and just slaloms, it might not always look that simple. And one of the biggest tricks to autocross is recognizing the visual deceptions and ignoring them in your head so you can concentrate on the core pieces. At the top, we have a basic five cone slalom and we can see a little pictogram indicating this is a pointer cone saying you need to start on the right. So we go through the gate and then we start on the right hand side or the top side of this uh, slalom and then we slalom our way through the rest of the cones. In this next one, we start with a gate and then we have another gate and another gate and they're all gates technically but you're not going to be driving way out here anyway so whether this cone exists or not and same for this one and all of the ones that are colored in white in this photo your driving line is exactly the same and recognizing that these cones are all in a line and this is a slalom can save you a lot of time when you're walking the course and trying to memorize this Instead of looking at this and saying, oh, this is uh, go straight through these two and then left and then right, you, you just look at this and be like, oh, actually, that's, that's just a slalom. And boom, you've now made it much easier to memorize this course and much easier to drive this course because you can now look at this entire section and say, that's a slalom, that's not five different gates. Same thing down here, more visual deception. They added a bunch more cones, but they're all on the outside. You're not going to drive way out there, so those cones don't matter. Just ignore them. Same thing down here. They added more cones down here. They added this weird thing. Looks like you're going to shoot through this little slide thing at the end. No, you're not. It's just a slalom again. So look for these kinds of visual deceptions and recognize them for what they are. Any, any questions on slaloms or, or gates? I know it seems simple, but... That's kind of the core and um, and how you deal with stuff. Uh, we'll show you a course map later, I think. Yeah. Um, but this is kind of the, the core of what we're teaching. All right. Okay. Uh, if you do come up with questions later, feel free to, to uh, jump dump them in chat, and we will definitely open it up for live Q&A at the end. Okay, so what happens when, not if, you do eventually hit a cone? If you go, by the way, uh, throughout the entire day on Saturday without hitting a cone, you're not driving close enough to the cones, you're not driving hard enough, you need to hit some cones on Saturday. And Sunday, hopefully. When you do hit a cone, if you knock it over, no matter where it is, if it's knocked over on its side or you somehow get it to stand up right upside down, that's a penalty. If you slide it out of the way, or if you knock it over and it rolls and it stands itself right back up again, if it's outside the box, the white chalk line or the paint line, if it's raining, we'll use something a little better than chalk. If it's outside the box, it's a penalty. If it's inside the box, no penalty. What counts as inside the box? Anything so long as it is touching or inside the chalk line. If it is touching, overlapping the chalk line by three millimeters, you're good. You win. Thank the corner worker. Uh, and as a corner worker, you'll check it. You'll say, hey, that's good. You'll wave it off, put it back in the box. That's the key. Yes. <laughs> and then and then run run back away because the next the next car, you don't want to give them an advantage. Yeah. Um, that is part of why we mentioned those hand signals. If you're a corner worker, you may be a couple hundred feet away from the captain with the radio that needs to call in the penalty, and they may not be able to hear you over the Roche Mustang that's coming, you know, piling towards them right now. And so you will wave that cone over your head to say, yes, it was, you know, two inches outside the box because the corner worker or corner captain might not be able to see that. Or if it actually was overlapping by those three millimeters, you're going to hold your hands down like this to say, nope, they're good. No penalty. It's within the box. And then you're going to put it back in the box fully and run out of the way again. Okay. Sometimes you might not hit a cone, but you're still going to get a penalty. And that penalty will be did not finish. We've got two examples on the left. They're both valid 
First, an obvious use case, uh, or not use case, an obvious case of driving correctly through a slalom. We see a lot more pointer cones on this than the previous example, but again, it's just either visual aid or visual deception, depending on how you want to see it. This is just a slalom. In this case, uh, let's say this person spun out. They lost control of their car. They did a little spin. Then they did the kind of thing that's definitely going to get them kicked out of the course uh, if you do this intentionally. Um, but the idea is they still went through the gate the correct way. This is not a DNF. It's a really slow time, but you will see your time on the timing system. You're not going to get penalized for it. This is a DNF. They missed this cone right here. They drove completely the wrong way. Uh, that will get scratched from their runs. You will not get a rerun if you DNF. And generally the two things you're looking for when you're course working to look for a off course or did not finish is them missing a gate. You go through the middle of the gate, two cones, you go through the middle. Um, so they go around one of those two or not alternating properly like the example uh, here on a slalom. Yeah. A uh, common question that people ask is, okay, if you run through an entire wall of cones, is that a DNF? Nope. Half their car was, you know, within the gate. They got a lot of penalties, but it's not a DNF. Uh, one exception being if you hit any of the cones after the finish lights. That is an automatic DNF at most regions. I assume no lens and DNF here. Okay. Yeah. Um, the idea being we really don't want you losing control or being out of control in any way after the finish lights, because after the finish lights, we have people standing around and potentially in danger. So any cones after the finish light, automatic DNF, we really don't want that happening. I don't, I don't know if we, we cover it, but when you cross the finish line, you need to get the car completely stopped um, or at least down to a walking pace. It is very common, especially as a novice, to come through the finish, look over at the timing system and just start going crazy and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're going 40 mile per hour out of parking lot of cars and people standing around. And that is very dangerous. So what we want you focused on first, because your time is not going to disappear, getting the car stopped and then proceeding at a walking pace, like five to 10 mile per hour um, to the to the paddock. And then you have time to look at your your times a lot of times it's on the the internet live timing uh, for an actual event so that's that's the priority after you get through the finish i hear walking pace thrown around a lot uh no one's actually driving two and a half miles per hour but realistically 10. uh we we don't want you driving 20 miles an hour through paddock or after finish get it down to about 10. we'll be happy with that okay uh so DNFs do happen, uh, but how can we best avoid them? Walking the course is the biggest one. Most of the time a DNF happens because you either don't know where the course is going or you were looking straight down, you weren't looking high enough uh, and you missed a gate that was coming up. And you're usually looking straight down because you didn't know where you were going. So walk the course, walk the course again, walk the course a third time. Try to have it memorized before your first run. That won't necessarily happen, won't necessarily happen all the time, but I will tell you when, for me personally, if I've decided this event matters, whichever event it is, if I've decided that an event matters to me, I guarantee you I'll have that course memorized before my first run. So how do I uh, get the course memorized? I'm gonna identify groups of elements. I'm gonna say, hey, those gates, uh, those are a slalom, or maybe they're just slightly offset. I'm going to drive it like a big slalom, but it's still basically a slalom, and I'm going to recognize this set of sequential gates are all slalom-like. I might call them a slalom. I might call them an offset, or I might call them wallums if it's... You'll see various things. There's names. You'll learn them all eventually. Uh, but that's the big idea is identify groups so that you're only trying to memorize five or six distinct pieces of the course. And then you can just replay those uh, five or six instead of trying to memorize left, right, left, right, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think if, the uh, biggest uh, thing when, when uh, Siemens mentioned that, like um, you may have a hundred cones on course or more and those, those groups, those key ones, may only be 10 cones or 15 or 20 cones. Um, 
your goal is to make it as little effort as possible to memorize that. Whatever learning technique is important to you, whether it be like David said, just closing your eyes and be able to memorize it um, or walking at a ton or saying, drawing down on a piece of paper and saying, these five cones are the important ones I'm going to focus on every time I come around to turn. Um, whatever, whatever your technique is, but um, try to make it simple. If you are driving or walking the course and you look at it and all you see is a sea of cones, that's going to be your red flag in your head. It says you haven't identified the key cones yet. So take a minute and try to figure out which cones are extra, which cones are you never going to be driving anywhere near and can ignore, and then start identifying those key cones. Once you've done that, you should be able to look at the course and immediately see those key cones and it no longer looks like a C because you're ignoring all of the extra. Okay, once you can replay the whole course in your head, you shouldn't really have problems with DNF. And at that point, the only reason you might DNF is because you maybe spun out and went around the wrong side of the cone because you couldn't didn't have the grip to, to make it through. We keep mentioning look ahead, but how far ahead are you looking? Where are you actually looking? Uh, in short, I think it's really easy to think of it in two ways. As you come into a corner, when you're at uh, the entry phase of a corner, you're probably eyeing the exit of a corner. Let's think about a basic 180 degree hairpin turn. As I'm coming in on one side of the turn, I'm gonna be jumping my eyes over to the exit where I wanna be back on the gas. I'm gonna be jumping my eyes back and forth a little bit. I'm not just gonna be pinned over there the whole time. But the idea is that if I know where I want the car to be on the exit, the peripheral vision and my uh, hand-eye coordination, assuming I have any of that, is going to get the car over there where I want it to be. As I get maybe halfway through the turn or maybe three quarters of the way through the turn, that path to the exit point is set. And I don't really need to be looking at that anymore. I'm going to now shift my eyes to the entry of the next corner. So when you're, go when you're on entry, you're looking at the exit. As you get halfway through, you're going to move. You're basically going to be at the exit phase at that point. And then you're going to move your eyes to the entry of the next corner. So you're always looking at least one element ahead. You might have walked to the course and said, hey, as I come through this turn, there's actually uh, you know, two turns up ahead that I really need to plan for. So as you come out of that hairpin, you might be bouncing your eyes between the entry of the next corner and the exit of the next corner. You'll figure that out as time goes on, but that's roughly how far ahead you want to be looking. And and that may require you looking out the side, like Absolutely. especially a big turnaround. A lot of people are kind of locked into their windshield, um, but a lot of times, like when I'm instructing, I'm pointing, hey, eyes over there, eyes over there. And for a big turnaround, similar to when you're riding a motorcycle, the car goes uh, where you look and where your hands are, um, so looking this way and kind of pointing to where you're going, the car will more easily end up there and you're going to position the car better for the turn as well. All right. Uh, I think this one's me. So, um, the, the racing line, there's lots of ways we can spend hours talking about optimal racing lines and things like that. I think the, the biggest thing, uh, with the racing line, of course, it's going to be the fastest way around the, the turn. And it's not a line that goes exactly between every cone, right? Um, what it's going to be is it's going to be a, a number of different conditions. It's going to be looking at the fastest sections. It's going to be looking at your car and where its strengths are at and how you can extract the shortest amount of time um, in, in getting across the course. Um, now, there's lots of things that, that go into that. There is uh, track layout, so the exact course that you have and how that line would, would, um, would lay out. There's your vehicle, a front wheel drive, a Corvette. All these cars are gonna have generally slightly different lines. Your tires, how old your tires are, the type of tires you have, your suspension, tons of stuff goes into play of the right line for your particular thing. But we're going to teach you the basics, right? Uh, ultimately, physics plays um, in, in all of these. So the, sta the same principles uh, apply uh, for all cars, uh, but um, differences whether, whether um, uh, what type of car you have, I guess. Um, so what you can see in this picture here is um, connecting turns together. So ideally, uh, again, we'll have a, a, a picture here in a minute that shows a bigger course that you're going to be running. Um, but it's not... 
doing a turn, resetting, doing a turn, resetting. It can be sometimes, but generally you're going to chain all these things together in the smoothest, most flowing way possible. And a good example is what you see here. So there's a blue line and a green line. Green line is if your end uh, goal is to go uh, to the right. Um, your uh, blue line is if you go uh, to the left. So as you can see, you're starting on the left-hand turn doing the classic outside, inside, outside. So that's where you see you start on the outside, you go towards the middle. We'll talk about that, which is the apex. And then you let the car go out a little bit. The interesting part, if you take the green line towards the middle, uh, David, you want to try to try to follow me on this one. But if you take the green line um, and you let the car push all the way out to the outside and your ultimate goal is to turn left there, you're going to be totally out of position, whereas the blue line is really the optimal line for turning left at the end. So um, again, connecting these all, and the way I do it, this is like a little bit more advanced, is um, I take the fastest spot of the course and I start working backwards uh, at building my my driving line. Um, don't have to worry about that right off the bat uh, on Saturday. But the important thing to know is connecting things together, making it smooth and flowing. You're almost always going to be faster than charging into a turn, braking, slowing down, and then getting lost and um, treating it as, as uh, straight lines and individual elements. All right, so let's talk about Apex. This is when you start getting more into the vehicle dynamics. Um, and so at least the terminology is set. So when you hear your instructors say uh, oversteer, understeer, uh, Apex, late Apex, early Apex, uh, geometric Apex, all these different terms, we want you to know what, what they're talking about. So um, the this is basically a 90 degree turn is what you're looking at here. We don't have the edges of the turn drawn. But if you think about that orange dot that there, that is essentially the inside or the dead center of a perfectly 90 degree turn. So that is quote unquote, the apex that can move depending on the shape of the turn and um, what you're trying to do after that. And that um, how you approach that apex and where that apex is in the turn um, is when the terminology changes. So a perfect apex or a geometric apex is you start all the way on the outside where you come closest to the inside of the middle of the corner is perfectly in the center of that geometrically perfect. Um, and then you let the car go all the way to the outside um, for if you those who have done track events, that's when you, you hear the term track out um, and you let the car go all the way out. By the way, you shouldn't be fighting the car in these elements. If you're ever forcing a car over to a specific spot or you, you uh, uh, aren't where you end up where you want to be, um, you've probably made your line a little bit wrong like you see here. All right. Early apex, the, this is probably going to be where you're going to make the most mistakes. This is where you turn in before you're supposed to. Um, the first time you autocross uh, and the first many times you autocross, you're going to see a turn and you're going to get excited and you're going to sell yourself. I need to go that way. And, and you're going to turn in because that's what a car does. We turn in when we want to turn. Um, but what you're going to you're going to find a number of times if you've turned into early and what that's going to do I'm visual if this is your turn and you want to end up over here, the car, you're going to turn into early and it's going to push the car way out much farther than you want it to be. Um, so early apexes can be good for a certain situation, um, but a lot of times uh, it's also you, you've too early apex and you've made a mistake. A late apex, this is what we generally want to teach you um, when, you're, when you're early on, is going to be the safest way. It's not always the fastest, but it's going to be the way that's easiest to not make mistakes and burn a whole bunch of time. Um, because you're going to be able to get on the gas really soon. What that is, is you wait to turn in. So you mentally tell yourself, pause, and then you turn in late. That's the backsiding concept. So if this is the middle apex cone and I'm going this way, backsiding is kind of telling yourself or um, repeating to yourself, I want to I want to put the car behind the cone as opposed to like edging the cone and passing it. So instead of turning in here, I'm going to wait, 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 then turn in and kind of come down on that, that cone. That's a late apex. Um, all this stuff, we're going to teach you when you're in car, we're going to talk about it. In your course walks, we'll talk about, okay, we want an apex here or there. Um, really tonight, we're just trying to introduce the, the concepts to you. You mentioned uh, sometimes early apex is faster, or vice versa. Sometimes late apex isn't the fastest. I, th I think maybe we could put some context around that. I would have to venture maybe 80, at least, if not 90% of turns, late apex is the right answer. Often, 
especially especially early on. Yeah. The problem with eight uh, early Apex is even if that's the right for the turn when you're a brand new novice, the um, tolerance for mistakes is a lot lower. Um, a late Apex will always have more traction available to it because you've generally slowed down. You've turned in later, more traction is available to you. Um, and it's just safer. Um, and we'll work you up to that. That's the difference yeah. is with a track uh, like uh, Atlanta Motor Speedway or Atlanta AMP or um, uh, Road Atlanta, you keep coming back and you get to work on that turn hundreds of times, right? You get f- three times, maybe 20, 30 times, like you'll get this, this Saturday. Um, it's not a lot of times. And so if you jump immediately to an early apex and you make a mistake, you're going to blow your run. You're going to spin. You're going to understeer and go off the course, things like that. We want you to be able to be on course and have fun the first time and work towards that speed. All right. So this is an example of a very simple novice course. Your course may be this course, or it may be just slightly tweaked from this. Um, and it's, it's not a lot of elements. Um, sorry. Back one. Um, sure there you go. I can see yours. All right. So, uh, David's the little pointer there. If everybody can see it, um, you're going to basically pull up to the start. Um, if you notice as I'm sitting at the start, before I even go, I'm looking all the way ahead at this first element. The thing I'm going to notice is there's a pointer cone there. So I need to be on the right side of that cone first. Cause remember it's pointing at the side you want. Um, this slalom is going to be a little bit slower for a normal slalom. It's going to be about 60, uh, 60 feet, but it'll be a good pace. The biggest thing with a slalom, uh, and you're going to hear your instructor say this a ton in general, is you want to be nice and smooth through those. A slalom, uh, especially one that's got even spacing between every cones, you can't just keep accelerating uh, through the slalom. You'll eventually run out of traction, and that's where you're going to hit a turn, or you're going to find I can't make that last cone. So what you're going to do is get up to a good pace there. Just be nice and smooth going through that. Um, as you see by the pointer that we had, wherever it went, uh, there it is. Um, so just kind of go through there nice and smooth. As we come out, I'm going to be looking all the way ahead at that other element. Um, the one that you see that says 26 miles per hour. Um, that is not a typical autocross element, but it's something we use uh, for uh, novices. This is basically a small skid pad and you go around it, right? Um, this one is going to teach you how you can be fast and as close to the cones, but you're going to hit a point where the faster you go, you're going to start pushing out and going away from the cones. So there's a fun balance here of the right amount of speed with the right amount of traction and the right amount of steering input and finding that perfect balance is going to be a sweet spot. You go over it, uh, then you're going to be slower. You go under it and, um, you're just slow through it. So just get around that element. Here's And then right here at the end, this is a great example of a big 180. This is where you're looking all the way out your side window. You're looking ahead. We may play with you. Sometimes after lunch, we screw with some of these elements and, and mix them up a little bit. So um, something's a little different. Um, but you want to be looking all the way ahead. Generally, if it's going to be shaped like that, you're going to be looking at that dead middle cone as your apex. Um, so the car should be closest to the inside of the turn there. And then naturally, if you add a whole bunch of gas, the car is going to push out. But if I'm looking way ahead, I've got this really annoying element that all of us absolutely hate called a Chicago box. It is really, really slow. It's good for novices because it teaches you patience, but it's really, really slow. So if I end up just goosing it, just getting all, all of that 600 horsepower um, out of that turn, I'm going to be going way too fast for sh- sh- Chicago box. And as, as much as it felt great to go super, super fast, you're going to be off course and you wasted all that time. A Chicago box is get in, get out. It's painful. It stinks. You got to be going slow enough um, to, to go in and then out of it. And yes, tech Titans, that cone is backwards. In the box. <laughs> Kudos to you. You get a free ride along from myself for catching that good catch. All three of them, I assume. Uh, well, the middle pointer cone, it's yeah. definitely yeah. out. All three of the tech Titans. Oh, all of them. All the Titans. Yes. All, <laughs> all right. Mon- Monica is the one there. Uh, I drive me out of too. So that's good. That's good. Um, so that that's painful. It sucks. Uh, but um, it's something that that is designed to teach you to be slow and not go too fast. Um, then the next set is just really some nice, smooth flowing offsets. Um, when we do the events and when you come on uh, su- when you come on Sunday, 
um, we have high speed offsets and that really teaches you to, to, to have a lot of courage and be able to get the car um, through some elements when it's nice and loose. This is probably going to be a little smoother, a little bit more under control um, to get you through that finish. Remember, we cross that finish line and we're going to be on the brakes. We're going to be slow and we're going to be under control. We're going to have lots of adrenaline. We're going to be screaming. We're going to be having fun. We're going to be high-fiving each other. We're going to be knocking seconds off our time each time, but we're, what we're going to be slowed down and under control. All right, questions other than finding the mistakes in the map, which was awesome. You can unmute yourself or throw throw them in there. What, 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 should, what should we wear, David? When, what's typical? I mean, I, outside of having racing gear, what, what would be uh, a good uh, outfit? Clothes are preferable, of course. There's the joke. Um, but um, it is – so the difference with autocross versus, like, road racing and HPEs and stuff, because my opinion uh, varies, um, you wear clothes appropriate for the day, but we want you wearing generally closed-toed shoes, um, no Crocs, no flip-flops, none of that stuff. Um, you want something you can be comfortable in. Um, that you can drive in, but it's going to be more about the day. So I prefer to take off raincoats and things like that. Once I sit in the car, um, the F mod that was mentioned is an open cockpit car. So I'm kind of stuck. Um, and certain cars and go-karts and stuff, it, uh, have other safety requirements, but for a normal, uh, kind of street car, which I think all of you have, um, just wear what's comfortable. Um, we will tell you, but suntan lotion, bring water, all that stuff. You're, um, my first autocross, I always get a sunburn because I always forget to bring suntan lotion because it's the beginning of summer. But um, wear, wear comfortable shoes. Um, I wear like wrestling shoes or really thin shoes because I like to feel the pedals. But that's something you can you can worry about later if you don't have them already. I'll point out uh, everyone should keep in mind the high at the moment. Last I looked, it was supposed to be 60 degrees uh, for Saturday. 60 degrees in the middle of an asphalt parking lot can be pretty warm. So, and I think it's going to be like a high of 37 or sorry, not high. The low is 37. So it could be really cold in the morning and kind of toasty in the afternoon. So dress appropriately, right? Layers, whatever your mom taught you to do for crazy weather like this. Yeah. And if you come in and we generally take July off because it gets so darn hot down here. But um, if it's 95 out and you're standing on asphalt, which we for nationals, we just stand out there for seven days. Um, it's it's a hundred plus degrees on the asphalt and it's, it's, it's really hot. Um, so you'll regret it if you don't. And if you get a sunburn or you get a sun poisoning or whatever it may be on Saturday and you want to come back Sunday, it's going to be a miserable day. So. Uh, no, walking, walking is a challenge for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, do absolutely bring that up when you arrive at the event or we can work with you ahead of time. Um, as Nolan mentioned earlier, we do make concessions for anyone that has uh, issues walking. The, uh, the rule against wheeled things is just the idea that everyone should be going the same speed. We don't want someone on a bike going 20 miles an hour getting a better idea of what the course is like at speed than everyone else that's walking. So Yeah, and we, we make accommodations for that. So it just depends on your situation, uh, but it's definitely something you want to clear. Um, for novice, we're not going to call you out on it. But um, some of our, our older folks that had you know bad knees or so, something like that, they may have a, a bike or an electric scooter. Um, at the bigger events, people bring golf carts, things like that. Um, I've, got, I've, I've got an electric scooter for that purpose. Yep. It's like a, at, at the when I'm on track days, you know, your pit. It's way off away or somewhere. And yep. I so would bring I that. I, I bring one to get to the bathrooms and I don't have that's any problems. What I, that's what I do at the <laughs> racetracks. <laughs> yeah. The, the bathrooms are walkable here, but um, I'm lazy. So um, what we would do, Gail, is is get that cleared ahead of time. So what we ask is if you're going to use the electric scooter on course when you get it cleared is try to go at a reasonable walking pace. What do we don't want? Well, to I just I, I basically just pedal with it. Mm, you know, that works. Yep. Yeah. That's what a lot of people with bikes will do is they'll sit on the bike seat and just Fred Flintstone it down the track. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's what I'd do. Yeah. I'm not going to try to race the course mm. with it. <laughs> so. yep. Even, even the people at nationals with a go-kart are like, blah, 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 blah. like it's painfully slow. So yeah, I'm uh, trying to walk around them. <laughs> yeah. All yeah. right. Uh, well, the question. Question. Go ahead, Gail. Sorry. Uh, Again, I have a six-point harness and a Hans device. Should I use it anyway? Um, Hans is 
probably overkill. I've tried it just for the fun of it at an autocross course, and it's really hard to look out your side window when you're doing it. Um, yeah. yeah. Speeds we're also going are generally less risky from a Hans device. There's no safety requirements at all in the SCCA autocross for a Hans device. Yeah, uh, that's what I figured. So some people use a neck brace. Um, I don't, I mean, I've got for the road racing I do, I've got everything, right? And I, um, Sometimes we'll wear a suit for some of these open wheel cars, but generally um, for normal autocross, I'll wear shorts and a t-shirt and a uh, helmet and sometimes gloves. Um, so it just kind of depends on, on what you need. Yeah. Okay. Depends. The more modded a car is, the more I'd want to be protected. So since you mentioned gloves, I'll mention for anyone, uh, you're going to be touching your tires a lot to maybe not at this first event, but a normal autocross you might be touching tires a lot to check temperatures, tire pressures, whatever. I started bringing driving gloves out just to protect my steering wheel, not necessarily because I wanted the better feel, but just some things to think about. What about uh, what tire pressures? Like, you know, at the racetracks, I, I set them at 28 to start out. I think I think we mentioned that. I mean, it's the short answer is it depends, and you're gonna hate that yeah. answer. But we always tell people to start high and then um, start bringing it down. We have some techniques um, that we'll show you Saturday. With uh, the simple way is chalking. The scientific way is is use a pyrometer, which do not invest in that right off the bat. But a couple of us, I'll try to bring mine on Saturday just to uh, for anybody that wants to borrow it. We can show you how to use it, and we can get you at that right uh, tire tire uh psi okay thanks all right so um this is bringing it all together so this is um me driving um the s2000 at ams this course is going to be or um it's going to be a little bit longer than you'll have um try to pay try to look through the windshield as opposed to looking at me but this gives you an idea of once you get experienced just how fast everything happens um and the different elements you have um we could go through it a second time, a positive if people want, but generally this is just how to tie, how to tie everything together for an autocross. My head is moving to look through the turns, not just for some fun. And let's all appreciate how slow he's going after he crossed the finish line there. Which actually I'm probably faster than I should be, but it gets <laughs> gets gets the point across. I yeah. think all all the pieces of this, and this was a, a pretty long course, uh, Saturdays won't be, um, but we can go up to a minute long course. Um, there's a lot to memorize, um, but I would say on that course, as I was watching myself, I haven't watched this in a while. Um, this was a number of years ago. Um, I was looking at maybe, I think 12 cones is what I counted, the ones that, that mattered out there. Um, but probably your first time watching that, you're like, oh my gosh, there's like hundreds of cones out there. I don't know which one to look at. Um, I was obviously going much faster. Um, we do, if you want, we can have the instructors drive your car if you're comfortable with it after you've done a few runs in it. And generally we're, we're not going to go hundred percent, but you're going to notice things come a lot quicker and it comes with practice, just the sense of speed and being able to get your hand eye coordination to deal with the, the, um, the, the speed and things are coming in process, all that, that comes with time that comes with practice um, and being able to know what a car can take. There was a lot of counter steering in there with part of, partially it's an S2000. That's the way I had it set up. But a lot of that is being able to feel what the car's doing, keeping it online and, and adjusting, uh, to what the car is doing, which is what we'll talk about in a second. And I think we've got, what do we got, like four or five more slides, something like that, just to kind of give you an idea of where we're at. 
Um, this is the more advanced stuff. Did you want to rewatch that again or just move on? I don't know. Does anybody else want to rewatch it and break it down? Or uh, we could always do it. All right, we'll keep going. When you're ready. Oh, right. There we go. There you go. Okay. All right. So this is this is more um, more science, but um, yeah, we can we can post a, a link to that. Um, there's tons of autocross videos if you just you know Google autocross, especially uh, SCCA or Atlanta. Um, all right. So vehicle dynamics. I got my Dodge Viper here because we all drive Vipers. Um, the the thing a lot of people don't think about is um, when you're now performance driving, when you're on the street. Uh, you're very rarely at the the max uh, performance of your car or the max performance of adhesion of your tires. The only time you really experience that is when you make a really big mistake or when you're out in the ice and the snow or uh, lower traction conditions, things like that. This weekend, you will be at the limit of your car. That's our goal. And uh, hopefully you'll be a little bit over the limit so you can learn what that feels like um, and be able to, to address it. So um, two concepts. Uh, the first one is a circle here. Um, so if you have a, a, a set of tires, um, you will have a maximum amount of grip that those tires can produce. Um, and we'll say it's one G for those that, you know, quote all the different uh, grip grip things. With that one G, you have to turn, you have to accelerate and you have to brake. Um, and you can only do so much of that all, all at one time. Um, so if you are fully accelerating, you cannot be fully turning the wheel something's going to happen um, and something's going to give up. And um, generally that's going to produce one of the things we're going to talk about. Um, if you're locking the brakes up and you're full on hundred percent braking in a straight line and you go to yank the wheel and start cranking at one direction, you've already used all the traction that the tires have, and that's going to create a problem. Um, so all of this is to say is your car has a maximum amount of traction and you want to, to be managing that traction and try not to be doing too much stuff at one time. Now, how do you do, do two different things? Because chances are you're going to need to turn while you're accelerating a little bit. Um, you're not going to turn everything into a light switch. You're not going to brake, let off the brake, turn, wait until the car is turned, get it straight, and then hit the accelerator. You're doing lots of things at once. What I always recommend is the concept of a string method. So if you look at if you take the steering wheel, I should have taken the steering wheel out of my race car. Um, if you have a steering wheel, what I want you to imagine is you have a piece of string going down to your right foot the, or your right leg. And if you've got your leg all the way pressed down on the accelerator coming into a turn, um, that string is tight because your foot is all the way down. In order to turn the wheel or do anything else, you got to let off that gas, go to the brake. When now it's fully braked again, before I can turn, I got to let off the brake a little bit. And then that string gets a little bit loose and allows me to turn the wheel. Now, before I can go jump back on that accelerator, that throttle pedal, I've got to start to unwind that wheel, which gives me a little bit more length on my string. And that allows me to slowly press the throttle until my steering wheel is perfectly straight again. Then I can be full throttle. Um, big mistake that we see all the time is people using throttles as on off switches and coming through a turn. Uh, trying to come too fast into a turn, trying to accelerate too soon and do too much um, turning. The big thing to understand is you've got a limited amount of grip in your tires and you can't do everything all at once. So this weekend is all going to be about managing that. Um, the second thing that's important to understand, and you've all experienced this, you've experienced it on roller coasters, you experienced it on the street, but let's say you have something sitting in your passenger street or in your truck or the bed of your uh, truck and you make a turn that thing is going to go flying, right? One direction because it's feeling those G-forces. Well, your, your car actually does the same thing. So um, we'll do it. what's in the picture. When you brake, what do you feel? You feel that car dive forward, right? That's what we call weight shift or weight transfer. So all that weight that um, was over the back wheels as you brake is going to go forward. Same thing with accelerating. As you accelerate, this is not hopefully what your car is doing, but all that weight is going to go towards the back. Then if you do it on turning, as you're turning one direction, you're going to be pulling that weight towards the outside or that weight's going to be trying to transfer on the outside, pulling that car away. So why is that important? Well, as you're moving all that weight around, you are adding and subtracting traction from all these different tires. So as you can imagine, when you go into braking, that weight is going forward. It is taking traction off the rear. Um, as you're accelerating, you're, you're putting 
more weight on the rear and you're taking it away from your driving tires. Um, same and why this matters is all of our different cars, we may want to turn a whole bunch and depending on what we're doing, we may not have enough traction there. Um, and what we're kind of, we're constantly doing is trying to manage that. So let's talk about what happens when we lose traction. Let's go to the next one. The two easiest concepts that we're going to talk about is oversteer and understeer. Um, and you're going to experience, well, hopefully both of these, but for, for most people at a minimum, one of these, um, and you will, if you're not experiencing one of these and you're not pushing the car enough. Um, so we're going to start with oversteer. This is the one that most people call fun. They enjoy, and it's a good thing, but it's drifting, right? And that is when, um, you are trying to turn the car and you have a loss of traction on the rear. And what happens is, um, the bottom picture with the car there, um, you're trying to turn and the car turns too much. In other words, you slide the car through the turn. Often you spin out. Sometimes you just drift it through the turn. By the way, drifting is not fast when it comes to these types of driving. Um, and the really the car of uh, the cause of that is lack of traction in the rear, right? And we're going to dive into each one of these in a second. So understeer, this happens a lot with front wheel drive cars, uh, all wheel drive cars. It can happen even in Corvettes and Mustangs and things like that. Um, this happens when you come into a turn and you try to turn the wheel and instead of turning the car pushes straight and, and tries to go forward. Um, a big common mistake there, uh, for, for a novice is the steering wheel turns. If it's not turning, I turn it more because a steering wheel makes the car turn. Um, the reality is, is a steering wheel wheel requests the car to turn your tires and the traction you have and all your vehicle dynamics will tell you whether you have enough traction to do what you're requesting. <laughs> and depending on what you're requesting, um, it may do something slightly differently. And that's what we're going to teach you this weekend is how to predict that, manage it, use it. So um, you're maximizing that speed um, throughout the turn. All right, next. All right, oversteer, smoky burnouts. Um, when you're sliding, uh, some of this is going to be reviewed for uh, those of us that grew up in the Midwest and snow, but um, biggest thing here. So when you're sliding, the car doesn't have a lot of traction on the rear or it has some. Um, but what we're trying to do is keep as much it's, as much as you can there. Things that make that infinitely more worse is going to the brakes. So in other words, uh, we already don't have enough traction on the rear. Going to the brakes is going to shift that weight forward and going to give you even less traction on the rear. Another thing before, typically before you can even touch the brakes, letting off the accelerator really quickly and um, jumping off of it because you're freaked out from the slide. Again, accelerating, car weight shifting going backwards. If I let off that accelerator really quickly, that weight's gonna shift forward and that slide's gonna become even worse. Often when you're driving in the snow and someone goes, I don't know what happened. The car just suddenly spun. It's because people are jumping off the, uh, jumping off the accelerator too quickly. Um, and this one is 90% of the time when I've seen an incident from a car hitting something at an autocross, it's this third bullet. And what it is, is you, you experience a loss of traction generally in a rear wheel drive vehicle. And you say, I'm going to catch it, or I'm going to power through it. And what you do is the car's sliding and you just keep the accelerator down or you push it harder. And the car goes like this and you don't slow down at all. And the car already has no traction uh, or uh, not a great amount of traction. And the car starts snapping back and forth. And depending on how fast you're going, it can travel a very long distance um, uh, in a short amount of time while you're out of control. So do not lift off the accelerator quickly. Do not try to power through it and use that accelerator to get you through the turn. Um, those are all bad things. But how, how do you deal with it? Um, because as I said, it's not fast to be sliding the car around all crazy like little slides. Okay. But you don't want to be, um, uh, completely looking out the side window because that's uh, the direction you're traveling. Um, smooth, pretend like you have an egg under your foot, um, either smoothly let off the, the gas, smoothly get onto the, the brake. Everything needs to be smooth when you're doing it on a lot of cars. If you start sliding, just letting off the throttle like 10% or even like five or 10% is enough um, to, to just get that traction back. So all you're doing is I don't have enough traction on the rear. I'm going to give it a little bit more traction by either taking the steering out or taking gas out. And that gives you enough traction momentarily where then you can get back into it. All of this is that circle we, we talked about, which is all about, I, I took too much traction from one of those things, braking, accelerating, turning, 
and I'm trying to give some back to get the grip back. The other thing you could do is turn into the skid, which is what you saw in that video. Instead of me just letting off constantly, I was counter steering and turning into the skid. Um, and that's that's another way of doing it um, to to uh, kind of uh, control the skid. So why did it occur in the first place? Um, it could be you came into a turn and you just yanked the wheel and threw the car into the turn and you you um, ex basically overcame the grip and the car started sliding. It could have been too much accelerator. You came into a turn and you just goosed it. You got on the gas too soon. You had that 700 horsepower and you wanted to use all 700 horses right off the bat as opposed to kind of uh, smoothly getting onto the gas. Um, or it could be, and we're not going to blame this this weekend, it could just be a car setup and you've got the car set up way wrong. Um, or the car in general, like an S2000, is generally just loose. Um, any of these things could contribute to it. Generally, you're not going to like this. It's you that caused the problem, not the car. Um, and that's we can work on us. That's the great part. We can we can learn what we did wrong. Any questions on oversteer or this awesome demo? I'll mention most of that applies to rear wheel drive cars simply because front wheel and all wheel drive cars won't oversteer very often. It can happen, and if you have one of those and you experience that. Uh, at uh, an event and you don't know what's going on, you don't understand it, absolutely talk to someone, get a ride along, and they'll walk you through how to deal with that in a front or all-wheel drive car. And I have driven a Viper in an autocross before. Uh, I think there's very few cars I haven't driven. Uh, all right, understeer, typical Porsche. Uh, I'm joking. Uh, all right, understeer, this is more likely what you're gonna, you're gonna experience um, in all your cars. And this is 99% of the time, maybe 100% of the time, driver error. Um, it can be car setup, of course, and traction. And, uh, you know, in the rain, you get more understeer, things like that. Um, but generally what's going to happen or what you're going to experience is you're going to want the car to turn a certain amount. And the car is going to tell you, no, I'm going to go straight instead. Or I'm going to go, I'm only going to turn a little bit when you want me to turn a lot of it. Um the things you do not want to do and somebody on this call, if not all of you on this call are going to do this, you're turning the wheel and the car is sliding forward and your natural human reaction. And there's no problem with this because everybody does it is my brain tells me I turn the wheel to get the car to turn more. So I'm just going to keep turning the wheel till it starts turning. You're actually making the problem worse, believe it or not, because remember, you already used up all the traction you had in your tires and asking it to turn more on that traction circle. You're just burning more traction uh, or asking for more traction than you have. Um, so turning the wheel more is is actually bad. Uh, believe it or not, this is in the second group. If you're trying to turn the car and it's not turning, turning the car away from where you're trying to go for a split second will return enough grip where you can probably then go back to turning. Um, and it's very counterintuitive because you, I want the car to go over there, but turning the car away actually gives you more grip where you can go back to that spot and potentially have full grip at that point. Um, so like when I drive front wheel drives, a lot of times I'm just trying to find that perfect point where I get the maximum grip for the maximum um, turning that I'm trying to do. Another thing is braking. Um, so the difference is with a with an oversteer, we're trying to keep that grip on the rear wheels. On a especially a front wheel drive car, um, if we're understeering, it's um, uh, on a front wheel drive car, it has to brake, accelerate, and turn all with the same wheels. So managing all that together is really important. So if you brake even more than you already are in the turn and you're already under steering, you could potentially make it worse. So generally you're going to ease up off the brake, ease up off the accelerator or turn away from the turn. Uh, and that's going to get you the grip you need. Um, so that's turned out of the skid. That's generally uh, let off the accelerator. Um, but the most important thing is let's just avoid it in the first place. How do you avoid it? Um, you've probably gone too fast into the turn. That's the easiest answer um, in that you should have slowed down more coming into that um, or you should have waited and turned a little bit. So sometimes that early apex you talked about, we you came in too tight and you go, oh, shoot, I need to be over here and I'm over here. And you try to correct it by just adding a ton of steering and you just make the problem worse. Uh, sometimes as car set up, the only time I would really argue that especially a stock car has that is there are some um, more gro grocery getter style cars that are set up super safe on the street for um, purposeful reasons. 
um, that um, you're just you're just going to be fighting it um, uh, from the beginning. But generally, you can still drive around that. You could break earlier. You can turn in later. Things like that. You can overcome that car setup um, just with your own skill. I think that's really important to mention is if you have one of those cars that is set up from the factory for massive understeer, like uh, we've got a couple Hyundais in here. I think there was a Focus or a Civic or something. You're going to be set up for understeer and so is everyone else in your class. So don't use it as an excuse. You're all driving that very similar setup car. Learn to drive it the way it was built. Yep. All right. Any questions on understeer? Okay, eventually something is going to go sideways, probably you. And when that does, what do you do? Uh, first, you're going to bring the car to a controlled stop. If you're spinning, if you're plowing through a wall of clones, whatever it is, bring it to a stop. Get yourself and your car under control. At that point, when you're adrenaline is calm enough that you can actually think straight if that's been a problem, then you may slowly, or not, not slowly, but you can, uh, in a controlled fashion, get back on course, turn the car around, whatever it is, get back on course. I, guess I probably should have put those bullets in a different order. You should check for corner workers in your way. Hopefully they are checking for you and they won't be in your way, but sometimes if there's the occasional newbie around, they might have gotten in your way by accident and you should look out for them. Okay, so you've gotten yourself under control, you've got your car under control, there's no one in your way. Get back on course and continue the rest of your lap on the course. Don't cut through the middle of it. There's course workers there or there might be course workers there and they're not looking for you in the middle of their worker station. They're looking for you on course and they're not going to be ready for you to drive through the middle of the course. So yes, we want you to get through the rest of the course and we want you to get through it quickly so that uh, you don't hold anyone up behind you, but we don't want you to risk other people's safety in that vein. So drive through the rest of the course in a controlled fashion. We don't want you going so slow that someone's going to catch up to you. We don't want you going so fast that you're going to spin out a second time on the same lap. That would be frowned upon. So get back on course, complete the lap, and then once you get back to your grid spot, maybe take a self-reflection moment to figure out, okay, why did I uh, go sideways? Why did I plow through that wall? Why was I understeering so much that I couldn't make it through the uh, corner? And I meant to actually bring this up in the last slide. Probably if you understeered and you understeered because you were going too fast into a corner, then you need to ask yourself, why was I going too fast into a corner? 99% of the time, it's because you weren't looking at the exit. You were eyeing the entry to the corner and you didn't realize where the exit of that corner was until you were already at the entry, at which point it was too late to slow down and make it through the corner. So if you're understeering a lot, you're probably not looking far enough ahead down the course. I miss anything there? Yeah, but... Okay, we're almost done. We got some random little bullet points in here. Um, for me, one of the most important things is that I be able to feel what the car is doing. And one of the best ways to do that is to get locked into the seat as much as possible. I went as far as getting the Schroth Quick Fit Harness, but before I did that, I learned a trick about scoot my seat all the way back. Uh, for me, it's all the way back because my legs are already pretty long. It might not be all the way back for you. And then pull my seat belt all the way out until it uh, started ratcheting. And I get it as tight as I can. And then I grab my seat and the steering wheel and I pull myself as far forward as possible. At that point, I look like a marshmallow, but I'm really tight in the seat and I can feel what the car is doing. And it's heavenly. Uh, give it a try. Uh, hands at nine and three. This really is the best place to hold the steering wheel. That's why F1 cars you know, only have places at nine and three. We don't drive at 10 and two. We don't drive at noon, right? Nine and three, it's the right place to hold your steering wheel. Two hands and hand off the shifter. A lot of people with a manual car will have a habit of keeping their hands uh, on the shifter. Um, you With a manual car, you shift a second generally in an autocross and you never touch it again. 
Um, yeah. Autos are fine. They're DSGs. There's lots of different settings we can show you. But um, two hands is going to be easier and less is going to be more precise and less exhausting. Uh, the other thing to make it less exhausting is when you're sitting there, you should be able to extend your hand out and your steering wheel should touch your wrist. And what that does is when you actually get the nine and three, you'll have a little bend in your elbow. And instead of using like your triceps and your upper shoulders, like from extending, you're going to be using a lot more muscles to help you um, steer the wheel. And, and you're going to be more precise uh, as a result of that. On that note, um, Nolan's absolutely right, uh, in my opinion, about the, you know, hitting, getting the steering wheel hitting right there on your wrist. Uh, for me, in a real car where I don't have unlimited uh, control over the ergonomics, I actually don't manage to hit that. Um, sometimes I'll be too close to the steering wheel because to me it's more important that I get locked in my seat. And a really cushy seat means I have to scoot the, you know, I, I can only get the seat belt so tight when I scoot all the way back. And then I will scoot myself as far forward as I need to to make the seat belt tight. And that ends up putting my hands too far too far forward. So I'm like sitting up on top of it, but that's okay. So long as I can safely uh, maneuver the car and safely get to the clutch or whatever pedals are in that car, I'm good. And that works for me better, but you try what works for you. Uh, take course, course notes on your walk. Uh, this is another one of those things where if I personally decide that this event, whatever event it is, matters to me, I'm probably taking course notes because I have, my memory is not quite that good. And so I'm going to be writing down what the key uh, corners are. If I do find one of those 10% corners, hey, that's an early apex, I'm going to write that down to make sure I remember that one. Um, you might do course notes at your first event. You might do it at your second event, whatever. If it matters to you, take some course notes. It might help. Uh, I do it on my phone. Maybe bring a notepad or something. Slow in, fast out. We talked about that a lot. That's the, the general um, light apex. Uh, is 90% of the time the right answer. Slow in and fast out is most of the time faster, it's always safer, and uh, it's more controlled. And uh, you'll be nicer to your car, you'll be faster, it's just better all around. And the two things I always say uh, that align to that is smooth is fast, so be smooth the whole time. You're generally gonna be faster. Your fastest times are gonna feel slow, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And then uh, look ahead, which we already mentioned before, like constantly be looking ahead. Otherwise, you're yeah. it's almost like looking ahead is important or something. <laughs> uh, hit the apex. Uh, if nothing else, hit the apex. The cutting distance is fast. Um, that doesn't mean driving directly to one cone, turning the car, driving directly to the next cone. But when you identify those key cones, make sure you're right up on top of them. This uh, video snapshot that I got is not at the starting line. This is in the middle of the course. I didn't hit every single cone that closely. I did uh, pick this screenshot very specifically. But that is how close you want to try and get to the cones. And your first run, you're probably going to be two, three, four feet off. Um, and that's okay. But try to work closer to getting this close to the cones. I read uh, something. Someone did the math. And it was something like if you're one foot off of every cone in a five cone slalom, just one foot away, that adds up to half a second by the end of the slalom. doesn't matter how far apart the cones are from each other. If you are one foot away from the cone, every single one of the five cones, you have added a half a second to your lap time by the time you get through that one element. So hit those cones, hit those apexes. At your first event, air up your tires. Don't air them down. Uh, if you've already got some racing experience, you've got 200 tread wears, whatever, you probably already know how to, how to start for your tires. But if you just have a normal street car, air up your tires, 40, 45, maybe, uh, that's probably high enough. Probably and high. then you can work down based on chalk lines to see how low you can get them. It, it depends on your car. So like a heavy car. So I heard some Miatas in there. Those you're not gonna need to go to 45. But if you've got uh, heard a four door, you know, five series BMW, that's going to be a lot heavier, um, probably going to have um, a little bit squishier tires. Those will be higher. Uh, I mean, something like 45 or even 40 is probably going to be too high at the end of the day. But it's it's all about starting there. What we don't want is you to start at 20 
that's too low generally and work your way up. It's easier to air the tires down and we'll show you how to do that. Um, your tires do heat up as the day goes on because um, you're putting heat into them and that causes your pressures to go up. So do know if you start them at 30 when it's cold out, they're probably going to creep up and you may need to manage them. And a ton of us are going to have tire gauges um, while we're there. Question, uh, the cone laying down, does that mean turn in, a turn in? That it does not necessarily mean this is where you start turning. It doesn't mean this is the apex per se. It is just a visual reference. Uh, in this case, if we, if you can see, yeah, there That's we go. One, I think. If you can see right here, this is actually the very beginning of a turn. Uh, I'm angled pretty far already because I'm trying to backside this cone, uh, backside to late apex, whatever you want to call it in this case. So I'm already turned in pretty hard. Uh, but if this were a racetrack and you could actually see curbing, what you would see is this is actually the very beginning of the turn. Yeah, pointer cones are there to help make it visually easier. Or if there's something that may be confusing, we may add a pointer cone. Um, hopefully, as long as it's not raining, we'll try to chalk the course for the novices that will add flower to the edges so it kind of looks like a road course and then it'll help you visually but um, generally if you see a pointer just make sure you're on the side of the cone that's pointing to not on the side oh, of the pointer, but the side on the that's pointing to. okay so it just means that to go to that cone on the opposite the right side. side the yeah. right side yep yeah okay i also just remembered i specifically grabbed this screenshot to show you my hands at nine and three even when they're turned pretty hard now, you may not want to hold your hands at 93 if you have to turn the wheel 180 degrees, but as much as is reasonable, keep your hands there. Um, there may be some really tight turns where you need to shuffle or you need to do hand over hand, however you need to manipulate the wheel, but as much as possible, keep your hands planted at 9 and 3. Uh, video can be a very useful tool. Um, I have the video because I think it's fun and cool and I love watching it, but I also use it as a learning tool. If you have a GoPro or if you want to start getting really fast, figure out a way to put it on your car. I like this angle specifically because I can teach myself how close I'm getting to the cones. And sometimes I'll move it to the other side of the car, which is much harder to, to learn where that side of your car is. So, uh, on, on tire wear, is there a good uh, camber angles? That's going to be as you, car specific again. That you, we'll get your as you can. That stuff. <laughs> I mean, autocross, uh, it's, it's harder than road racing because a lot of people are going to be driving them on the streets. So, like, I used to run a ton of tow on the S2000 and I just ate through tires on the street, like 5,000 miles on some of these tires. Um, so, you obviously need to take into account what you're using the car for. But in general, it's whatever, however much camber you can get for the class is what you want. Um, and that's either going to be in a completely stock car and you're just maxing it out. Or if you're in a modified car, you can play around with the different things. Um, that's another thing we need to talk about car classing. We can help talk you through the mods you have or haven't done to your car. My biggest advice, if you're thinking about doing a ton of mods and you think you're going to get in an autocross, hold off buying those until you know what you want to do. Because some mods like, I don't know, a carbon fiber, uh, hood will put you in a class that your car doesn't belong. Um, and a carbon fiber hood is not going to save you boatloads of time, um, at least on autocross. So, so what you should really do is get to learn autocrossing and then just go into a spec class because that's always the right answer. He's telling you that because he's in that. All right. So let's, uh, before we finish up and open it up for Q and a, let's set some learning goals for whether you're an instructed novice student or just here for fun runs on Saturday, it'd be really good to go into the day on Saturday with some specific goals. The biggest one, the first one has to be getting in the habit of keeping your eyes up, looking at the right uh, distance down the course. As Nolan talked about, smooth is fast. Uh, we don't just yank the wheel as hard as we can as we go into a corner. The wheel, the tires aren't going to respond that fast. Uh, stomping on the gas, stomping on the brakes, your whole car can't respond that fast. Smooth is fast. Threshold braking. Uh, this is a really common one for novices. They won't actually hit the brakes all the way. 
There's no reason for that. We don't need to be coasting down the course. That's not fast. Should always be doing something. Going into the accelerator, hard on the brakes, whatever. Make sure to learn how to hit uh, threshold braking. If you have ABS, stomp on that brake pedal really hard and learn how quickly your car can really come to a stop. If you don't have ABS, cool. You have a fun challenge to learn, and it's you'll you'll know when you uh, lock the tires up. Backsiding the cones. These are really good uh, things to learn. If you're not uh, the, the idea of where that backsiding comes from is you want to hit the cone with the back tires only. If you can knock a cone over, if you can drive over the corner of a cone with your back tires, you did it right, you win a pat on the back. Uh, try and feel the balance of the car shift as you uh, play around. We might have a, an actual skid pad, not just the 360 degree turn um, at the event on Saturday. Even if we don't though, try and find an opportunity to feel the car turn more or less as you hit the brakes more or less or get on the gas more or less. Being able to feel the weight move back and forth and cause and uh, release understeer and oversteer, it's gonna be a really valuable lesson if you can manage to, to do that. I don't know if we mentioned it yet, uh, but try and keep your eyes up as you drive down the course. That's a relatively important goal uh, to manage. And uh, never coast. I think we mentioned that one, but it's another one to keep in mind. And uh, I think we, we killed the rest of these horses pretty thoroughly by now. So We only went over by 26 minutes. <laughs> That's nothing. We got at least four minutes before anyone uh, should want to go. So. Uh, Keith, I see you have raised your hand. We're at the end. So go well, I just I just had a couple of, I guess, hacks for everybody that's not been out there. Uh, site specific there are regular bathrooms so if your mom or wife or somebody's coming they don't have to worry about portalettes um, also when we take the lunch break there is a chick-fil-a and a wendy's down the road actually a little bit of everything down the road but it is down the road so i learned that i just pack a lunch and uh, yeah much, much quicker yeah yeah, yeah i do wendy's but as you, um, is there a lunch break uh, Saturday? That's probably a good logistics. We'll have a lunch break. I would not. I would ask that no one count on having enough time to drive somewhere, get lunch, and come back. Um, that, to me, seems like a risky thing to do because, uh, especially if you are supposed to be working immediately after the lunch break, as opposed to driving. Um, if you're driving and you're okay missing your first run, I guess go for it. Uh, but if you're working immediately after the lunch break, please bring your lunch. Once you have come out to a few and you actually get a feel for, for how long you have between, then that'd be a different story. Uh, any other questions? We are at the Q&A phase at this point. I had a quick question about helmets. Uh, open face helmet, perfectly fine for this? Absolutely. Okay, we we'll be debating if I get a helmet, do I get full face, open face? Um, yeah, that's that's kind of a here's here's the thing. A helmet for autocross is good for 15 years. My experience has been after 10, it gets kind of nasty if you're using it all the time. So you do want to think about what are you potentially going to do in the next 10 years? Because yeah. if you buy an open face helmet, say an, a motorcycle rated open face helmet, those are going to be cheaper. And if you're only going to autocross, uh, it's probably the right way to go for a lot of people because you save money. But if you eventually want to do like HPDs or, or track days or you want to do carding with it or anything like that, a closed face may be a better option for you. So you just got to kind of ask yourself what you're going to do. Um, there's three or four or five different places around the Atlanta area um, that you can try on helmets. And I would highly recommend that because a medium is not a medium is not a medium is not a medium and they fit differently. Um, and having a properly fit helmet is, is going to be really important. So um, that is everything from Summit, which is uh, two exits away from the uh, the racetrack uh, or AMS. Um, so if you come to the Navas Day and you want to use one of our loaner helmets, that's fine. Um, and you say, oh my goodness, I'm addicted to this. I'm going to go buy a helmet on the way home. You can do that. Um, on my side of town, there's uh, Race Day Safety, which is kind of on the west side of town. Um, there's you know, I guess technically GT can help you, but there's uh, north side of town up by Amp. There's uh, uh, Discovery Parts. Um, just try to get a good quality helmet. Make sure it's Snell rated. That's the biggest thing. Okay, cool. Thanks. I'll toss in there. Uh, 
open face, big, big vote for open face for me. I do track days as well. Uh, open face is still allowed at SCCA track days and whatnot. Depends on the track, the company. But, oh, okay. So, well, SCCA at least. Yeah, SCCA are uh, fine. And for me, the open face is so much cooler. And especially here in the South. I mean, I came from Missouri and that was pretty hot up there most of the time too. Um, open face and cool and not having hot breath coming back on me. That's really important. So. Yeah, you can spend a hundred dollars on the helmet, or you can spend three thousand dollars on the helmet. Like, there's all options in between there. <laughs> Not this. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's any still hundred dollar helmets. <laughs> okay, sorry. Cool. Next. Yeah, thanks for the tips. Anybody else? Cool. We'll be we'll be around Saturday. Um, find any one of us. Myself, Keith, um, there'll be a lot more instructors there, a lot of folks with experience. Some of us will be wearing uh, annoyingly colored shirts so you can easily identify us. But even at normal events, even if you're you're not just there Saturday, um, people are always willing to ride along with you if you're struggling. Um, I take ride-alongs. You know, I've been doing this 21 years. I still learn things from ride-alongs, like people riding along with me. I co-drive with, with somebody in the same car and every run i'm learning something from another driver you are never good enough to not try to improve and, and learn something and get some instruction um no matter how many years you've been doing it even the pros even lewis hamilton and max verstappen they're looking at the data they have engineers telling them where they have opportunity to go faster so the biggest thing is we want you open to learn this weekend we want you willing to have fun we want you um getting better each run and we're going to get you there just be willing to listen to us and um you know apply it so what else david uh one last thing i was gonna end with if any of you are not signed up as a novice school registration which uh, means you're signed up for the fun runs we do still have spots available as novice school registrations and we can switch you over if you what's want. the difference Ah, wonderful question. The difference is novice school students will be paired one on one with an instructor for the whole day uh, for, for the, the day that you're not out on course working. If you're signed up for fun runs, you're going to have access to instructors when they're available and not in the middle of something else. Uh, but the novice school, we will dedicate an instructor to just you during your run groups. And it's going to be awesome because they're all as good as me and other David. And you're going to learn a lot. How do you switch over? I think I signed up for the fun runs. Uh, you just ideally email me. Uh, but if you're the only one that speaks up right now, then I will <laughs> look you up and put you. Okay. Should I take that as a commitment? You want yeah, me to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most okay. definitely. Yeah, you're, you're going to, if it's your first event, you're going to want an instructor all the time. Um, there are some people out there that are like, no, I drive fast on the street. I don't need an instructor. <laughs> I'll tell you, you've got a lot of room to improve with that attitude. So, <laughs> we, we will knock seconds off your car faster than you can, uh, off of your driving time rather. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Dress appropriately, bring your stuff, check your car out, make sure there's tire or air in your tires and, uh, get plenty of sleep the night before. You're going to have a lot of adrenaline, and it's uh, it's more exhausting than you'll imagine. So we're excited to have everybody, though. Thank you all so much. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thanks. Thank you.